Now here, well, it's such a frustrating day, isn't it? We've got the, for the umpteenth time, we've got the tractors going around with the rope. There was a bad moment about just two or three minutes ago when the umbrella went back up again under the, the, the fourth umpire there and the, the covers went back on and that's, that's still the situation. The ground staff standing there, uh, most of them wearing masks, looking a little vacantly out towards the right as if that's possibly where the weather's coming from. But if it is, then there's nothing really happening. There's, there's, no, there's no breeze. There's, there's nothing at all to clear this cloud that's been here ever since we woke up first thing this morning. And it really hasn't shifted, and a bit of rain comes in, and then it goes away and wafts away. It hasn't rained properly at all all day. It's just been that frustrating drizzle that uh, has just uh, blown in and out. England chose to bat first, despite that uh, those uh, overhead conditions, and uh, they lost Sibley for naught. I think they were naught for one. But uh, since then, I'm looking up for the score, and of course the scoreboards have gone completely blank. But I know a man who's got his fingers on the numbers over there, haven't you, Andy? Yes. That's fascinating, Andrew. Unfortunately, we can't hear you. And it's not because you're miles away, but unfortunately, you forgot to press that little button. Sorry. Agnes. There you are. That's, oh, yeah, sounds yeah. so much better. Years in the game. Uh, <laughs> 35 for one, 17.4 overs. Roach, none for two from six overs, four maidens. Gabriel, one for 19 from five overs with one maiden. Um, uh, Joseph, uh, 3.4 overs, uh, none for 11 with a maiden. And Jason Holder, 3 overs, 1 maiden, none for 3. Uh, Denley, 14 off 48 balls. And Rory Burns, 20 off 55 balls, both with 3 boundaries. So Denley is in that dangerous territory where he scores t between 10 and 39, I think it is, 17 times and, and gets out. So that's what everyone's uh, waiting to see today. If he can, He's played very well, I must say. He's looked, uh, he's looked very composed, very solid, got a lot of short stuff especially from, uh, from Shannon Gabriel. And I can see him now, he's just waiting. It must be a nightmare, actually, as a batsman uh, on a day like today. You're in and out and in and out. And do you take your pads off? Do you sit down? How long are you going to be off for? Nobody knows. It's just sit there and, and wait and uh, wait for the umpires to make a decision. And we've got two more arriving on the scene uh, out in the middle, but unfortunately, I think one of those, Richard Illingworth, is about to get his umbrella out. Yep, there he goes. He's giving it, uh, giving it a shake. And up it goes, and so that's the telltale sign that, uh, that drizzle is still falling over the ground and uh, the cover's on, the ground staff's still going round and round with that rope. And uh, we wait and see, the, the floodlights are on. It's just been such a disappointing, disappointing day. We've looked forward to this so much, and I'm sure the players have too, because the players of both sides have they've been uh, in these bubbles, the West Indies, for much of the time up in Manchester, where they, uh, they were quarantined in a hotel on the ground. And then only when the, that had all been done and they'd played a bit and warmed up and had some nets and so on, could they then come down here to Southampton, where, they, of course, they then joined uh, the England team in this sort of confinement, uh, as it were. And so the players were just desperate to, desperate to get on with the game. But uh, unfortunately today, it simply hasn't happened. We've got the hose pipes being rolled out now on the on the square itself, which suggests, I'm afraid, that uh, this is going to be more than just a, a minor hiccup. And we've got some covers now going onto a, a television camera down to our right. There seem to be lashing it down. Out go the sheets again. Alistair Cook, what's, what do you reckon? It is. It must be hard for a bat. So I, know you, I know you said bat first, and that's fine. And, and, and undoubtedly, uh, you, you'll be shown to be right. <laughs> but it must be. On the, but on the flip side, not only have you got the the overhead conditions and the ball doing a bit and it's all a bit fresh and so on, but on and off and on and off like this. How do you, how do you keep yourself going? Yeah, it's not ideal, is it? But I think no. they've just got to see today, is getting through today, and we all think the forecast is getting, is getting better, will get a bit warmer, so that pitch will dry out even more. I do, I do love the umpires, I don't know. It's not really raining, but no. you know, it was that symbolic moment as if the crowd was here. They're going to put the umbrella up to tell yep. everyone that it's raining. That's it, why we're not playing. It is playing, actually raining, everybody. But, yeah. It is not really raining that hard, it's is in, it? It's incredibly frustrating. Well, no, because one of the umpires there hasn't got his umbrella <laughs> up. So uh, that's Richard Kettleborough. But, uh, it, it, I don't know. It's, it's just uh, such a disappointing start to the day. Have you seen much of Dom Sibley's replay? What did you make of that? Was it just an aberration or, or was it, it, it was, or was it a bit of both actually? Did it just, just do enough? Well, there's two types of leads, aren't there? Good ones and bad ones. And unfortunately that one has to go in the bad slot. Yeah. But it's actually good bowling, wasn't it, actually, from, from Gabriel, your friend. He, you know, he, he banged away there 
at a really good length his first couple of overs and that one just probably just jagged back a little bit more than um, obviously a bit more than Sibley thought uh, and actually Denley almost did exactly the same a bit later on which jagged even further and actually that yes. would have been a it almost went like an off break um, yeah look He's, he's just made a mistake, isn't he? He, he knows he, you're, you're taught as an opener about trying to lead the ball if it's not in your area. And it, he got it slightly wrong. It's, I mean, it doesn't look great, does it? Um, but you're out. It's, uh, it's, uh, you always wish you had your time again, but it's... Uh, it's it good must bowling. be such a... Just so frustrating. You've got a bat in your hand. Oh, no. To be honest, I haven't done it that many times. I right. normally nick them or kick them. So um, yes. to leave them, it's, uh, it is it is it's obviously just a, just a strange thing. And actually, I just think West Indies... They bowled okay, but they, I know... A bit short, perhaps? Yeah, I know it's like, mm. you, you hate to compare bowlers to, to machines and stuff. Actually, the first four or five overs, they really, they seemed to make England play a lot more. And then Roach came, um, went back, went to 7-2. He took out mm. his square leg to have another, you know, and had to have four slips and gully, which is kind of a, the right thing to, uh, to attack. But it, it dragged him to bowl wide, and you, you know, he, he probably bowled two or three overs at Burns. And Burns didn't have to play a shot. And in these conditions, to leaving the ball is a... I know Sibley left it and got out, but you want to try and leave him. You don't want to be playing too much because if it nips, you, you're encouraging the edge. And I think that ball is slightly too pretty lengths. Pretty lengths, just e- slightly easy leaves and not quite making the defender. And when they have... There hasn't been many drives of them. The, all the scoring shots have been off the back foot. Um, cuts and pulls and the odd clip, so... I think West Indies will be OK. I mean, they'll be saying if we go bang, bang now, suddenly four yeah. for three, that would be absolutely fine. But I think they haven't bowled quite as well as they possibly could have done. 35 for one, it is, it is, it is technically T, although that's gone. And I think the umpires now are heading off because um, more sheets are, are coming on and the, the tractor rope drivers, as it were, have, have also given up for now. So I can see more lashing down of television cameras and so on. So I think the feeling is that there's going to be a... A lengthy interruption here. Are we um, are we right to focus on on Denley and Crawley as being the fall guys for Joe Root? Or, I mean, is, is Sibley in that category as well? I mean, if, it's, it's, it just seems to be such a sort of ruthless business, this, isn't it? Because you know the captain's going to come back. Yeah, I, I think on a long term plan, I think you'd hope the selectors aren't just taking on this one game whoever scores the most runs stays and whoever doesn't um is gone because that that's a bit too short term for my liking and think but but if like if this if denley here gets a score it's a you know he's done a really good job over his last number of test matches uh, uh, averaging mid 30s i think is it 100 balls almost per per every innings he's faced um on average he's done a, a fantastic job just the only thing he hasn't done has got that score if he scores 100 he definitely plays and then you know, probably Crawley does miss out. But I think they, they showed their hand, didn't they, that they, their preferred opening at batting is Sibley and Burns. That's the, that's the partnership they want to go with. And, you know, one bad game from one of those two won't mean that they miss out the next game. I think it's pretty much a straight shootout between... Denley and Crawley. Uh, yeah. I, I think they. How prob- do you feel on that situation as well? That was. That was really yeah, I, I think they probably will go with will keep with Denley. Actually, I think that's because he's batting in number three, yeah. in the number three position. That's what I think they, that's probably what they'd like to happen uh, and keep and keep Zach learning. He's at a different um, stage of his career, but if Zach comes in in this game and and gets a hundred, then that's just the nature of it. There's not much in. There's not much between them. I mean, obviously he, he's at a different stage of his career than Denley, a lot more inexperienced, but. Know, could could have a ten year international career that they probably want to push him if they could, but Denley's done a done a good job in, in laying a platform. So if he gets a score here, you'd probably stick with him. With people tuning in, I suspect, uh, maybe coming back from work or something like that today, uh, who weren't with us earlier on. Uh, and, well, the, the dropping of Stuart Broadus, anyway, to put it really, I mean, they had a choice. I, I was quite interested in that in the Ben Stokes... Although this is probably his only match as, as captain for now, at least he, he, I felt he owned that decision when I interviewed him down there uh, on the on the boundary edge, as we have to do now. He did say it was a difficult decision for him to make, as if, as if it was it was it was his. Well, I, I heard that line as well, as if you know he did. You know, you don't know quite. You know, when it was, you know, it, I don't think have, I've had the situation in England. You know, you got your twelve, and you pretty much knew the spare bowler was, yes. you know, in the twelve, and he was. You probably didn't pick the team pretty much before, um, before the game, as the score gets announced on the say on the Monday, and you're playing on the Thursday. But obviously, here with the circumstance of thirty players being around, obviously cut to twenty odd, and um, uh, yeah, it sounded like that he was heavily involved in that decision. I'll be surprised if Ed Smith wasn't 
happy with it. You know, mm. I think he has. You know, as a, you'd you'd like to think the chief selector, the head selector, whatever he's called, is, you know, is involved in in, in making such a big decision. Um, yes. the, the question I would would have uh, would love to know the answer to if this was like what the World Test Championship final, would right. Stuart Broad would Stuart Broad have played? That's an imp- impossible one to answer, isn't it? It, it is, yeah. but it's... Um, You're suggesting that it's still... I don't know, he still has a future, maybe? Or, or, or a very short-term... No, he definitely, definitely has a future. I don't yeah. think, I'm not comparing that at all, but I'd just love to know, hand on heart, whether they're thinking this is the best side we've got at the moment, and it could be, and, that's just, and they're saying that actually since lockdown, since this... You know that actually Stuart might have been might be missing a little bit of rhythm that and snap that every other bowler has. We I don't know. We haven't seen no. any of the nets. We you know you could barely watch that three day game on your on. You know it was there, but it's very hard to follow. And you, you know the camera's such a far, such camera. a long way away. You, yeah. can, you can't you can't really learn too much from him. But um, that would be an interesting question to ask. Absolutely, there's no doubt that this dropping of Stuart Broad, as you kind of have to say, call it. It's not the end of his career at all. It just, it's just what's yeah. happened. And, you know, he will be... We all know the kind of type of character he is. If he gets the ball in his hands in his next Test match, it will be, you know, here's that stubborn character. Look, how dare you leave me out? Yeah. And that's a great place for English cricket to be. Obviously not great this morning for Stuart Broad to hear the news, but it's a great place to have a, a, an unbelievably motivated Stuart Broad to demand his place yeah. back. What, what was quite interesting was that they were going to announce the 11 last night or yesterday afternoon or early evening and then they chose not to and I, and I just wonder why that was because they knew what the weather was going to be like and he could have said, well, if they were considering, I don't know, they played five quick bowlers in their last test, didn't they? Yeah. I mean, if they were considering doing that again, leaving the spinner out, oh, oh, I, I yeah. could have understood that. But I just if, if they were always figuring on leaving Stuart Broad out, why they didn't do it last night. Or it could have been a game behind these closed doors. You just do not know. Was, was, were they just waiting for, say, Joffre, Jimmy or, you know, Mark? They, he might have just been feeling something in training to and just say, why? Yeah. You know, you just don't know, do you, on that decision. But, uh, or if it rained all day today, like there was forecast that it could have rained heavily all day. Obviously, I think it's, it came through a bit earlier or gone a little bit further north in Southampton. Actually, that could have greened up a huge amount, and they yes. actually. But like, look, they've they've obviously made the decision, in my opinion, that um, the in Australia in eighteen months' time, you know, it's very unlikely that Stuart Broad and James Anderson will be playing together on too many of those occasions. That they're seeing that they need that variety in the attack, and they need to expose these guys. You know, they're obviously really seriously good cricketers, but the more Test cricket they play. The more times they are taking responsibility, bowling with the new ball, um, all that kind of stuff, without one of Stuart or, or Jimmy, then you know, they will gain so much more from, from that experience. And obviously the selectors will, will see as well. Yeah. And how's life in your part of the world? All cricket mad and can't get out there and play. They're obviously desperate, aren't they, to get going? I think they've got their first game. The Beds Farmers got their <laughs> first game on Saturday. I think as soon as the restrictions were off, they found, found, someone before, uh, found a game before harvest kicks in. I think yeah. we normally, they normally have you know, middle of July off and August off. So uh, I don't know if they might see they might try and sneak a couple of fixtures in August. But, uh, Are you going to play? Um, I've been pretty bad attending a training at the moment. <laughs> I'm not quite quick enough on the WhatsApp. It was, it, oh. Like the six, you know, you could only have six people tra- playing together, couldn't you? That right. was when they released, like, relaxed it. You could only have a, a six in the net. And as soon as that was announced, they were like, we're having this net, and it was the first come, first served. And I wasn't quite quick enough to get us. So I don't know about selection. No. Uh, and also, you remember the last time I publicly announced I was playing for it, you hammered me for about 48 hours. Well, I think you my, failed, didn't you? I did, and I, and, I, and I really tried as well. We, we were, what was it? I think we were two two runs for five wickets or six wickets, oh, and I went in. So I thought it's a good time Sorry. to try and get some runs, and I got clean ball by an off spinner. And what's happening with Essex? What, what, what are you? What's the sort of the daily routine there? Uh, well, they're back in training now. Uh, so we started last week with the first day was. So I went in on the Tuesday, and it was isolated training. So you had your slot where you went in on your own. You know, you did. You went for a run. You had a bat. You kind of went in, literally on a one-way circuit. So you came in, did all the temperature tests, did did your bat, kind of walked around the net, did your run, and then got ushered out. You could, and then kind of the next person followed in. So the coach was there all day for pretty much a 45-minute session. I think we had to do that once. So it was a, a machine you're facing. No, no. Actually, we you know we could still have the 
stick. The dog stick, right, right. dog stick. And then we had then nets the next time, but only six of us. So that was on the Thursday. I think today and yesterday, they'll be giving me sticks because I'm obviously skiving this week. Yes, of course. Um, they're, they're back to like 12, so actually now. So Right. Um, and, still, and, and the run, they'll be what? They'll be running around the ground. Well, just running at like, you know, some interval training. Sprints or something. And stuff, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it, I mean, it must be great to be back, but it's. It's not much preparation, is it, if you think no. about when he might be playing? Well, I mean, they, they announced 1st of August about three weeks ago, but yeah. we still don't quite know... What it's going to be. Well, they say red ball cricket, but, yeah. you know, where's the fixtures? I don't actually know what the date is today. Well, there's a meeting soon that we're supposed to, <laughs> well, supposed coming, hard, supposed to happen. Hard, hardly to know where, where we're playing, who we're playing, yeah. what we're playing for. Um, well, the bowlers can't be very Well, that, that's... The, the, I mean, obviously, and it's not the players' fault at all. Like, no. The, obviously, I think you, you, they've been doing their running... I haven't had no gym, no nothing. So the lads have been running, but there's a big difference from kind of sitting down all day in your day and then going for a half an hour, 45 minute run, yes. and then just kind of chilling out Watching the rest of the day, which yeah. is nothing else they could do, to actually then going to bowl 25 overs and a thing. And you know, it seems you know that is you know, these guys have been up these are about five or six weeks to get to this level yeah. now, um, and we're pretty much given the first class guys. Three, three and a half weeks to do, and that, that is a slightly yeah. risky thing. I wonder whether, looking back, whether the a ten over, you know, a fifty over game start with that gives a limit of how much the bowlers can bowl. Might have been a better option, but look, this is you know, it's so easy to sit on the fence and you know not have to, when you're not actually having to make the decision. Then yeah. it could be proved right in you know in when we come August and everyone's playing cricket again. Yeah, yeah, it's that day in the field, isn't it? And then coming back yeah. the next day and it's bowling an, again at eleven o'clock. It's the next day, isn't it? Yeah. Like you're well and good, like and also no matter how fit you are and whatever you get on the yo-yo test, how many sprints you do, it's that ninety-six overs yeah. in the field, isn't it? That that standing on your feet to then back it up. At Eleven o'clock when you've got the, yeah. the second new ball and you're the opposition of three hundred for four and it's you're looking like you're going to do another you yeah. know another forty overs that's when bodies break. Well, let's hope that's not the case. That uh, there's no bodies breaking here at the moment. There's no cricket. But it, it, like we're saying, like you're saying the other day, actually yesterday we were talking about well, this is what we did in pre-season when we hadn't bowled yeah, since September. It was, you turned well, up, true. turned up, and you went straight into a pre-season friendly, pretty much. Yeah, we used to. Well, we used to. So like I say, you probably finish about, I don't know, first week in September, and you'd be given one of two envelopes. So one would have a P60 in it, and yeah. one would have a P45 in it. <laughs> so you've got, you got your P60. <laughs> you're like, great, that's all right. Yes, yes, see, see you next year, lads. Uh, first of April? There'll be a note about the first of April. Yes, see you on the first of April. You know, good luck. And if it's P45, it was thanks for your service, and, uh, and off you go. <laughs> But we both probably ended up in the same place because you literally went down to the job centre because it, you, yeah. it was six month contracts, obviously, and you had to find what you had to find a job. So you know, there weren't many people were going to employ professional cricketers just over a winter because they were going to be gone in April, and not many people had great qualifications. You know, one or two had gone to university, but just tend to go straight into cricket. And you just did what you could, what you could find. I, I, I think my. One of my favourite winter jobs was, was driving the old diesel, as they called her, affectionately, for an asbestos company in Leicester. I slightly regret that bit now, but I was delivering asbestos stuff around the place. But in an old diesel lorry that was such a contraption that you actually had to stand up with your heel on the accelerator to make it go. <laughs> and she didn't let me... I did, I did a couple of years in the old diesel, and then one day we had to take a bend and it just didn't... Didn't bother didn't taking it. it. It just went straight into the hedge, and that was it. That was the end of the old diesel, and um, that was the end of my driving career, I think, as well. But I mean, that was sort of that thing. Big lorry. Did. It was big enough. I think it was seven and a half ton or something. So you had big, to big take enough. A test. No, I, I didn't have to take HGV. I think it was like seven and a half tons. I think it had quite a lot of stuff in the Probably back. Yeah, granddad rights and you for the old prices <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> quite a lot of asbestos in the back. Anyway, um, that, it was in those days. But that was that was the end of the old diesel. So then I progressed um, to working in a window factory. Um, I mean, my DIYs are appalling. So I felt well, really sorry. In. Yeah, oh. well, no, you're actually making them. Oh, right. So you turn up, all the bits were there, the bits of wood, and have a sort of a, yeah. a diagram and a mallet. <laughs> and, uh, and off you go. And I, I always felt, I mean, I was, I was, it's a great thing um, you know, to have these, these sort of guarantees, isn't it? The, the, the building Neither. guarantees, Neither. yeah. Because anyone who bought, who, who bought a window in the 1980s from uh, T.L. Bennett's Ratby... <laughs> They still Could've. going? I think they are, funnily enough. But um, poof, they were, they were, there were some real shockers turned out, I suspect. So that was another winter. And then and they got into radio. But, but, but actually, during that winter, because you were working, you know, there weren't any nets or anything, and there was no training, and there was no programme. 
No. So you literally turned up on April the 1st having done nothing. And so... Was there any indoor? Any indoor... Well, there might have been, but, but there was an indoor school at Grace Road, but the, the run-up was about three yards. Um, and I say, you're working. So we, you, you turn up, and uh, Gower was in charge, so uh, there wasn't a huge amount of uh, <laughs> physical activity. Uh, we'd jog down to the Polytechnic, uh, down along the canal. That was about ten minutes each way. Uh, do a little bit of circuit training. That was, quite, that was quite hard work. Then a little bit of badminton, perhaps. Mm. Then we'd run back again to the Cricketers' Pub on Grace Road. And that's the view for the day? Well, no, 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 no. You'd have a cheese roll, yeah. uh, one or two would have a pint, and then into the ne- indoor nets, and that was the hard work, because you would, you'd bowl and bowl and bowl. Yeah. And so this is the point you were making. After the first three or four days, you were so stiff, <laughs> you could, like, hardly, you know, could you, hardly move. You said you came charging in. Well I, did, well, I charged in the first couple of days, and then it was <laughs> stiffness, but... I don't know. We never seem. We didn't never seem to get outside as early as you do now. I, 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 don't know whether, I mean, clearly, you know, I went to the Oval just before lockdown. They've got a huge marquee up, mm. and they're they're playing in there. I mean, we didn't do that at Grace Road, but I do remember playing in the the Champions County match against MCC around about I don't know eighteenth, nineteenth of April, I should think, and it was our first, my first bowl outside. I was at Lords, and it was quite an important game. That's about our fourth game now. Yeah, isn't it? it's, it's, kind of... it's incredible. We used, we used to go to Fenners, so Essex would go first. And about, I don't know, 15th of April or something, play three days. Gucci gets 100 and then... Yeah, oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then we'd go there, and it always seemed cold, so long johns and, and so on. But then, of course, we'd go into Benson Hedges one oh, day. Oh, right, straight into... 55 overs. So from that, so the championship was still on the back burner, so you'd play a sort of zonal, zonal Benson and Hedges. And so if you lost a day... I think you probably had a rain day, and if you lost a bit to rain, well, that's kind of accepted, you know. And then the championship would start in, in May. So you'd, you'd bowled a bit by the time that started. And what was it, 16 games? Would it have been 16 games? No, it was more than that. What, what championship games? Yeah. 23 or 24 or... Oh, we worked hard in those days. And we'd have well, how all did the, that work? How, you played each other... Well, you'd flog each other up and down the country, and you'd, you'd, you'd... Yeah, you'd play everyone once and then half of them twice. So you don't usually end up playing, in our case, North Ants twice, yeah. Derby twice, oh, Knox twice. The local team. Generally, usually, you'd play the local ones twice. And that would be how it was. It, perhaps it's fairer, everyone play yeah, each yeah. other just the once. But that's, yeah, that, that's, that's how it was. So I, I, do, I do, I feel for the bowlers a bit, because these fellows are just used to bowling all the time, aren't yeah. they? They're just so grooved. The rhythm is there, and the, 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 you could lose a little bit of timing or something. But like the batsman too, you're in, you, you're just in the in the rhythm. Well, Jimmy always said to us he'd much rather just three or four days off, a week off, rather than the really big period because yeah, you sure. have, if you, I mean, I know this is un- unavoidable, but if you're saying you're going to rest him, he'd always say just give me the week because if you're any longer than that, your body gets so used to not bowling that it takes you almost two weeks to get back to where you were yes. before you're resting and he's like oh, that's just wasted time so he he preferred short days off like short little breaks and actually it's worked really well for him you know apart from the last couple of years or so but mm. up to the, before then his record is unbelievable staying fit and you know that's actually look at it that was one of the and i think the big thing that the bowlers do now is try not to bowl three days in a row so i doubt many of them obviously would have bowled very much yesterday because you couldn't guarantee, you know, if they bowled today, they bowled yesterday in the nets, yes. and they bowled today in the, and then bowled the next day. That's when they're concerned about the injuries three or four days in a row. So most of them wouldn't have bowled yesterday, come what may, and then, and then start today. Um, How did you feel? Because you, when did you last pick up a bat then before this, this training? Well, so we were in Abu Dhabi when, ah. and the things so that was, I, I, I shouldn't really know the date, but. It's probably about the 18th of Mar- right. March, maybe we came back. Yeah, and then I didn't pick up a bat until uh, last week. But you hadn't picked one up either, presumably, from about September? Or had, or had you been doing a bit? No, so I started, to get, I started in February, like end of January, February, so I had some sessions there. Yeah. How does that feel after a long well, break? Well, it's amazing. Like, actually, that first time you hit the ball, you know, the first, okay, the, give it the first 10 minutes just to get the rust off it, but then it's amazing how, how cleanly you hit the ball because you're... You haven't got anything to, to worry on. You are just focusing on... For me, I'll just focus and just watch the ball because that's what the, and let everything happen and just try and get into some kind of rhythm. And you find the rhythm pretty quickly and then you do what every other start tinkering with yeah, little yes. bits of there and, that, and kind of that, you're already on that circle. Like the golf rather, swing. Yeah. Rather than just leave it and play. Actually, it's the first... Like last week, I hit the ball quite nicely, actually. Um, 
I mean, a bit it was underarms and, and dog sticks, but it wasn't yes. really the bowlers. I hit them really nice. And, but yeah, it's just the volume. You want to increase the volume because you need to almost get through that and then you're into, into the rhythm. But yeah, it comes back quite quickly. You get a couple of cut shots away and the Rory Burns clip off his leg and you're, <laughs> you're OK. Norman Gifford, dear old fella, he always used to say, best when fresh. I goes, no, yeah. don't, don't bother having a net. Best when fresh. Well, I'm facing Sylvester Clark tomorrow. <laughs> best when fresh, best when fresh. And that was it. That was, that was, that was, that was how it used to be. There is, there is some truth in that. Well, look, it, it looks a bit brighter to me, but the covers are still on and the floodlights are shining. Well, I think the groundsman had enough, I guess. Well, I think they might have reached breaking point. I'm not sure where they are. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, they've gone. There's no what's sign the, of Winston. What's the latest that we can start now? This is the this is what as an opening batter now that obviously Burns and Denley will be set obviously done okay, done all right to to guts it out so far. They'll be thinking they'll be going around to Phil Neil, the, the team manager. What's the latest we can start? Well if there's still two hours to go. If it's still dark hours. by here now are we off? I'm looking, I'm looking to my right for assistance, but I think I'm, I'm, they can go until half past seven tonight, can't we? So So you can start at you could start at Quarter to seven. You could start at seven. Uh, you couldn't start after couldn't start seven. seven. You no, can't start after you could seven. start at ten to seven. I suppose you want to be really horrible. Yeah. But I reckon that would probably. probably no. right. the, the good news is, if, if your room's anywhere like mine, we we could actually. We often talked about commentating in our pajamas <laughs> uh, when it's late. Actually, here we literally could. Yeah. I mean, my room has got just as good, almost just as good a view here. It's probably a little bit more over fine leg. But we were, we were talking of possibly because I think Andy, have you brought your pajamas with you? We'll possibly have going to have a pajama day. <laughs> Of course I have. You have bought your pyjamas? I've got a pair for every day of the game. Have you? (laughs) And you're happy to reveal them? Absolutely not. Oh, that's a shame. Are you a pyjama person? Well, not normally. I tend to be in hotels. Just in case. Yeah, except I did explain earlier on how I got got rumbled um, by housekeeping, which isn't going to happen here. But, uh, no, generally, um, Adam's brought his, I think. In fact, Adam said his boy's dressing gown and slippers with him, so he can, uh, <laughs> he, he, he'll fit in. So we, that might well happen, but we are go- we're not going anywhere, and uh, we, we'll be staying here and keeping an eye on, an eye on things. We're going to stand you down for a minute, though, though, uh, though Cookie, and uh, we'll give people some proper entertainment. Um, because... <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't taken you long, has it? <laughs> Ten I've, minutes? Yeah, no, I've, this is the first time we've been really on air properly this, since the lockdown. You. I've missed you, Cookie. I haven't had any pranks. Before you get, I haven't had any pranks yet. Oh, I haven't had any, like, you've got a park here, you've got to do that. Or No, 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 I, not yet. I did actually ring you on the way down, didn't I, saying, what what do I need to do? Do I need, when Because you, you're down here before me. I was like, half expecting something out there. You're very good to me, actually. All yeah. I asked for, I was going to ask you for, until I got cut off with a jar of Marmite. Oh. Because, unfortunately... Downstairs at breakfast, there's no marmite, and I didn't bring my own. But um, ne- next time, next that'll time, be done. Anyway, uh, thank you, Alistair. No, you may have heard uh, and seen in the last few weeks. We have been looking back at these classic matches between England and West Indies, and uh, the first of our games uh, was part of that Blackwash Tour, 1984. I played in the last Test in that series. It wasn't nice. Uh, England were blown away in the fourth innings at Lords as an early Test match by Gordon Greenwich. The West Indies chased down 342 inside 67 overs for the loss of just one wicket. It was an incredible, incredible performance. Uh, Gordon Greenwich at 214 not out. I think it was the end of Jeff Miller's test career. He'll remind me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was. So to give a bit of context as to where the sides are coming from into that series, England had failed to win any of their six matches in 1984 coming into that Lord's Test. West Indies, though, gone through 1982 and 1983 completely unbeaten in Test cricket. So uh, joining me to go through it all uh, was the West Indian commentator Fazia Mohammed from his home in Trinidad and Andy Zaltzman was tucked up in his pyjamas in Streatham. And I began by asking Fazia if this was the absolute peak of West Indies dominance. Over oh, those glory days, I guess. But, but yeah, <laughs> and I think when, when we look at that Lord's Test match, that was almost a year to the day from that shock loss to India in the World Cup final of 1983. And if you look at what happened subsequently, you, you got a sense that the West Indies were about to really to show the world who's really the boss of world cricket because they had gone to India, won that Test Series 3-0. They had beaten Australia 3-0 in the Caribbean without losing a second innings wicket over five Test matches. And then, of course, won by an innings in Birmingham. So they were really up for it uh, coming to Lords. And clearly they, they, were on, they were on a track which suggested that they had a point to prove. Just looking at the rundown of, the, of, of their team, actually. Greenwich, Haynes, Gomes, Richards, Lloyd, of course, Captain, Dujon, Marshall, Baptiste, Harper, Garner and Small, Milton Small, 
uh, was playing in uh, in that test match. So uh, Michael Holding would be missing for that one then. Yeah, and that, that was an interesting 11 because you look at that now and you'd say, well, okay, what are Baptiste and Small doing in a West Indies team that is considered probably the greatest of all time? No disrespect to either of these two gentlemen. But you'll have to remember as well that that was in the aftermath of the rebel tours of South Africa. There was no Colin Croft anymore available. Sylvester Clark was out of the running. Ezra Mosley out of the running. Hartley Allen, who was not was sort of like a fringe player, would have been out of the running as well. So if you've got Michael Holding injured, and as we saw later on in this Black Horse series, Winston Davis would have been drafted in uh, to, to feature, which just uh, underscores the, the, the depth of the West Indies fast bowlers. But yeah, I mean, you wouldn't think automatically of Milton Small and Eldine Baptiste no. figuring in your West Indies four fast bowlers. No. Colin, Andy, in terms of um, of what this team was doing to everybody, <laughs> uh, people always talk about the, the 1980s West Indians versus the 1990s Australians. Uh, it's an interesting comparison, but what, what, what were the West Indies up to? Uh, well, having lost a controversial series in New Zealand uh, early in the decade, they'd uh, then won six of their next seven series. They'd lost only one out of 32 test matches in that time coming into the 1984 uh, series. Um uh, and uh, they had a uh, throughout the 1980s. West Indies had a win-loss uh, record: 43 wins, eight losses in Test cricket, which uh, is the highest win-loss ratio for a decade of any team in Test history that's played at least at least 20 matches. The 2000s Australians are second behind them. So, if you want a, a comparison between the Great West Indies and the Great Australians, I know decades are a bit vague as a as a time measure, but that you know shows they are you know probably the two greatest teams that have played. Uh, Played uh, played Test cricket, um, and in terms of the individuals, the uh, the world rankings have been sort of backdated throughout international uh, history. And uh, the West Indies at the time, three of the top six batsmen in the world, Clive Lloyd, Viv Richards and Gordon Greenwich, plus Haynes, Dujon and Larry Gomes in the top 20. England only had two players in the top 20 that time, Gower and Botham, and uh, in bowling, Marshall and Garner, who did play uh, the, the Lord's Test, uh, second and third in the world, holding absent for that game. Fifth, uh, England had Bob Willis nearing the end of his career, uh, still in the top ten, and Ian Botham ju- just outside it. So there was a, a, a vast difference in terms of the the quality of teams coming into that. That, that said, although England had a, a poor winter in 83-84, losing in Pakistan and New Zealand, uh, they, they had been pretty strong at home in previous summers. They'd won eight of their previous nine series, the exception being the West Indies' previous tour in in 1980. So, uh, although we sort of tend to look back on uh, this period of English cricket uh, from behind whatever sofa we, we choose to locate ourselves, they, 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 they had been pretty reliable at home, until this summer, but as as Faz said, they'd been absolutely thrashed in uh, in the first test of the series. So there were some ominous signs coming into this game at Lords. Yeah, they were, they were thrashed, as you said, at Edgebaston uh, by an innings and 180 runs. Up comes Garner, bills this one, and Willis. Oh, he plays it up on outside the off stump. He's given out court. He stands there, looks at umpire Barry Mayer. It looks a bit wet off the inside edge, and I think he probably got a nick there. Out, caught by Dujon, off Garner to give Garner his five wickets in this innings. As it is, West Indies have won by one innings and 180 runs, which is a pretty big target. So, uh, hammering at edge bass, and it's worth, therefore, running through the team that England put out for this second Test match. Fowler and uh, Chris Broad, a debut for him. Uh, why was he there playing in this Test match, only the second match in a series? Well, how about this for poor old Andy Lloyd? Dear me. Oh, I didn't like the look of that at all. Just got him on the side of the head, I would think, where that protective plastic or perspex comes down. But that did look very nasty. So a horrible blow for Andy Lloyd in his his first test match. Uh, of course, I still I still remember seeing that as a sickening blow. So Broad comes in to make his debut, made 50 actually in the first innings. Gower the captain, Lamb Gatting back in the side as well. Botham, Downton, Miller, Pringle, Foster and Willis being the England team. And uh, it, I don't know, Andy, but, but in terms of debuts, <laughs> perhaps as an opening batsman <laughs> in particular, I mean, up against the, the, the attack, OK, we've, we've, we've established was actually missing holding. But for Broad actually to come out and make 50 in his first test innings against that attack is a pretty good effort. Baptiste in again from the nursery end. 
bowls and whips it away off his toes and that's 50 in the first test to be played by Chris Broad his first season with Knox after moving from Gloucestershire and a very warm round of appreciation from the crowd here the England total goes up to 96 without loss this is the 34th over Chris Broad 50 not out and Graham Fowler 30 not out uh, yeah, superb. It's a partnership of 101, one of England's two century stands of the entire series of five tests, and the other came in the second innings of this same game between uh, Ian Botham and Alan Lamb. It was one of only three opening stands of 100 against West Indies in the six years from 1984 to 1989 inclusive, and in fact, um, uh, Broad was involved in two of them, the second one in 1988, so of course England then dropped him one match after that, such was selection at, at the time. And Graham Fowler's century in that first innings at Lords in a 10-year period from uh, mid-April 1981 to mid-April 1991, there were only eight centuries by openers against West Indies in 75 tests. Openers averaged 24 against the West Indies, against all other teams combined, 37. So for, for Fowler and Broad to bat as well as they did on that first morning, albeit without Michael Holding there, that was uh, a truly heroic effort of, uh, of batsmanship. Fowler goes back, square cuts, four runs, there's his hundred. There's his 100, 103, and that was a splendid stroke. It wasn't all that short. He made room, he cut it beautifully. Uh, fine of Baptiste at backward point. It went into the crowd in front of the grandstand. And there is Fowler's second Test 100. Mm. I must say, I, I played in the last match of this series with Fowler and Broad still there. They were pretty shot. <laughs> so someone, someone went boo loudly in the background. Go, ah! they, they, they really had, they'd weathered. Weather some ferocious storms. Well played uh, to Graham Fowler. 55 to Broad, as I mentioned. Lamb, 23. Botham, 30. Downton, 23. The tail, as usual, swept away. England all out for 286. Malcolm Marshall taking six for 85. And I wonder, Fazir, when we talk about this great West Indies side and, and the way that it did evolve, for me, I think this was Marshall's absolute peak. I mean, you could say that, that probably without being unkind... Michael Holding has, has had his best. He actually bowled quite a lot of this series off his short run. Um, Joel Garner again, perhaps just oh, just going over the hill. But this was this was Marshall at his very best. Absolutely, and I, and I don't think Mike, uh, even Mikey himself would, would, would disagree uh, with with that assessment because uh, I, again, because there was that that uncertain period immediately post those rebel tours of South Africa, and uh, the West Indies and West Indies fans, and I'm sure Captain Clive Lloyd would have been looking to see if someone like a Malcolm Marshall, who actually started his Test career in the absence of those who had gone to Kerry Packer in 1978-79 when he went to India with a depleted West Indies team. And he really stepped it up, Malcolm Marshall. And, 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 and I agree with you 100%. He, he clearly made it his intent from 1983, taking on India in the Caribbean, and subsequently, even with the disappointments of the World Cup, he recognized, West Indians recognized, that Malcolm Marshall was the genuine spearhead of this West Indies attack. Marshall turns now. In, he bowls, and Foster goes forward, and he's out, caught there by Harper at third step. A very quick catch, it went low to him. Harper got it beautifully in both hands, threw it aloft, and Marshall has got his fifth wicket of the innings. He's just so skillful, wasn't he? I mean, he wasn't... I mean, he could bowl extremely fast, and he wasn't a big man at all. In fact, quite, quite a short man, really, in terms of, of, of height but a beautiful athlete, and then not pace, OK, he'll give it away a bit, and then he'll just swing it, and he'll pitch the ball up and seam it. I mean, he really was multi-talented. He wasn't just a straight-out fast bowler. Indeed he was, and I think that was the danger with facing up to a Malcolm Marshall for the first time, because he didn't have that great height of a Joel Garner or some of the other guys. Even Michael Holding was lethal and athletic, but a bit taller, and it was difficult to get away. Uh, and maybe that's why you'd see so many batsmen being hit Nice man, though. You always said sorry when he hit me. I don't know if he did to anybody else, but I was, I was always very fond of Malcolm uh, for that. Here he is then, taking his, his sixth wicket as Ingham will bowl out for 286. Marshall, a few little stuttering steps before breaking into his quick run-up to Willis, and Willis is bowled. That's the end of the innings. England all out for 286. Willis bowled by Marshall for two. Marshall gets his sixth wicket in the innings. Downton is 23 not out. England all out for 286. Well, I love it to hear 
Tony Cozier commentating on the end there. Poor old Bob Willis. 286 all out. I, 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 that's that's not necessarily a, a dreadful score for England to make against West Indies in those days, Andy. Was it? Uh, not, not not too catastrophic. One of their uh, best first inning scores against West Indies of the decade. In fact, in the second innings, they made, made 300. And that was the only time in five series against the West Indies that England topped 250 in both innings of a test. Uh, that Lord's test of, uh, of 84. And in fact, to, to give an idea of the long-term strength of the West Indies, no other team scored over 250 in both innings of a test against them until four years after this game, 30 test matches, uh, until Pakistan did so in 1988. Uh, it's worth looking a bit at Malcolm Marshall statistically. Obviously, he was a glorious bowler to watch in terms of his craft and athleticism. But that, that series in uh, 1984 was one of, of a string of seven series in a row in which he took uh, over 20 wickets at an average under 24, and five of them he averaged under 20. And uh, th- from 1983, when he became established in the West Indies side, through to the end of the decade, uh, he took uh, 292 wickets, averaged 19. So he, he was unquestionably one of the greatest bowlers of all time. Yeah, no doubt about that. 286 all out. Well, at West Indies, bowled out then for 245. Viv Richards made 72. Clive Lloyd, 39. Uh, Malcolm Marshall, 29. 44 from Eldine Baptiste is popping up there. Obviously, very useful runs, but still a handy lead for England. And who got the wickets? Of course, it was Ian Botham. Comes in now to Richards and wraps him on the pad. He's out leg before. Ampamir has given Richards leg before wicket to Botham. West Indies 138 for four, with Richards leg before wicket to Botham for 72. 27.4 over six maidens, 8 for 103. Garland just plays up on outside, he's nicked it, he's caught again well in front of first slip by Downton, a good falling catch. Garner caught Downton, bowled Botham for six. West Indies are all out for 245. And that means that Botham has got his eight wickets and now needs five to take 300 wickets. England lead by 41, and the interesting thing is the Broad, who only fielded for a short time today, has been resting, will come in and bat in spite of his groin trouble. 2.45 all out, Ian Botham, eight wickets, including his old mate Viv Richards, LBW, uh, for 72. There's something about West Indies and Ian Botham and Viv Richards. It was... It, it it did spark Ian up, and and this this was a bit of a I don't know a, a, a reappearance I think of Ian Botham at his best. It, it it just lost it a little bit. I mean, the the late seventies when he started swing proper swing and pace, and this was back to his his, his very best again. Do you remember this stint? Well, I think I was pr- probably at school, but it, it's certainly true as you say. Both of them had had uh, declined from his uh, his early career pomp up to the end of that uh, legendary 1981 Ashes series. 202 wickets, averaged 21. But from then until the start of this uh, Lord's Test, in another 27 Tests, 85 wickets, averaged 37. So it had been a quite a significant decline in both of them's performance. I think you probably know better than me, but I think he had some back trouble. In fact, it was his first six-wicket innings since the uh, Ashes test at the Oval, the sixth test of the 1981 series, and he was only uh, to have one more six-wicket innings in his career, which was the final test of the summer against Sri Lanka uh, back at Lord. So it was something of a, re- a return to form, but didn't... Uh, and he, and he, had a, he had a pretty strong series, statistically, in this series, but it didn't signal he was necessarily back to his uh, his uh, his absolute peak. But it, but it did it did seem Agus that that certainly the, the the duel between the two Somerset teammates Botham and Richards it was clearly something that 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 brought either the best or the worst out because I recall Botham as captain remember he was made West uh, sorry the England captain for a tour of the West Indies in 1981 and and uh, before that and and then subsequently uh, of course gave up the captaincy and so on uh, but he, he was challenged by Richards who came on to bowl on the final day of the test match in Trinidad. And both of them just couldn't resist the temptation of taking on Richards with Jeffrey Boycott batting at the other end. And he was caught at mid-off by Mikey Holding. So they, they were the best and the worst of each other because they just seemed, whenever they confronted each other, something was bound to happen that you'd remember. Great mates and fierce competitors, I must say. I remember, again, the last test of the series... Uh, 
both of them actually bowling properly fast. He got Jeff Dujon out, it was his 300th test wicket. And I was at mid-on. I remember it was as, as, as quick a ball as I can remember. So it, it, both of them really was uh, back to his best in this series. Ingo England, then a lead of 41. Uh, we heard there about Chris Broad's groin strain. Well, he was out for a duck uh, to Joel Garner's bowling. And pretty quickly, England were 88 for four. This is... Marshall's eighth over, naught for 15 so far. Up he comes, bowls this one outside the off and he's padded up again, and he's LBW again, playing no stroke, and I simply do not understand it. 88 for four, England, and getting LBW bowl Marshall for 29. Oh, and I do remember that so clearly, and it's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, no-one would have known the Lord Slope better than Mike Gatting, and there for the second time. Malcolm Marshall has just nipped that ball back at him and he's playing no shot, but again, Fazio, it just demonstrates the skill of, of Malcolm Marshall. And it was one of his party tricks. You'd see him do it four years again uh, when, when the, the Western News were back in England in 1988. Uh, Graham Brooch was then back in, in, in the England team. And he'd do that over and over again. And, and, and even then, and, and, and certainly in 1984, he was perfecting the art of, of the swing, away swinger, away swinger, away swinger, and then the batsman gets lulled into complicity, then comes that beautiful in swinger, and you trap plum in front. He, he really was someone at that stage, not just with that lethal pace, but developing all the other tricks of the master craftsman as a fast bowler. Yeah, indeed. But anyway, 88 for four, runs scored though. Alan Lamb, 110, Ian Botham, 81, and runs actually came quite uh, in quite straightforward fashion. Here now is Marshall again from the nursery end. Up to the wicket, bowls to Botham. Botham drives four runs. He hit that on the up. It went away like a guided missile. It hit the fencing there in front of the mound stand, bounced about five yards back, and honestly no one had moved before it had hit the fencing. What a, what a stroke, though. Lamb on 99, waiting here. Marshall comes up, bowls to him, and he's cut that one. That's it! It's cut that for four down to backward point, and Lamb has made a hundred, a very welcome one to him, back in the runs in Test cricket, and he is 103 not out, and England are 273 for six, and one or two people, I'm afraid, running on to congratulate him. What a splendid innings by Alan Lamb. So Alan Lamb going really well, the company of Ian Botham as well, then a couple of wickets fell, and then this extraordinary situation where the fourth evening, England have a, a lead of 328. Alan Lamb's still there. There's three wickets still in hand. And off they come for bad light with nearly an hour to go. And I, again, I remember the booing and uh, what people were thinking, or howls of, of derision from the Lord's crowd. In fact, we can hear it. They must go on, please. Well, if they, go, if they come off for bad light, the batsmen, they'll be... I mean, they're simply mad. Lamb is looking at the umpires as though he's longing for them to offer it to them. Pringle is out there. I don't know whether they've looked up at David Gar for instructions. Now David Evans is having one. They're coming off. Would you believe it? And the Lord's crowd are appalled at that, and with good reason, because England have got a chance of winning this game, and they appear now to be throwing it away because time is of the essence if they're going to bowl the West Indies out. They've got three good wickets left. They've got a lead of, at this moment, 328 runs. And here they are with an hour's play left, just under an hour's play left, and they're going to waste the chance of getting runs on the board. Well, it's, um, it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> Good old Trevor, putting things into perspective uh, there. But it, it, it did seem a very strange decision to make, didn't it? With, with, with certainly Lamb set and the West Indies have been out there in the field for some time and runs to be scored and 1-0 and down in the, in the, in the series and, and a victory to be had, Fazir. Well, we didn't mind at all from a West Indies perspective <laughs> because if, if you're going to take, take the bad light when you're in such an advantageous position, I, I mean, everything else thereafter, and I mean, we, we saw what happened on the last day. Uh, and how it, how it unfolded, and we could always speculate as to what could have been, but maybe it might have just have been that 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 siege mentality that you know you know things have been going so wrong so often against the West Indies, and you don't realize it doesn't click in that look, you're on top now, put the boot in, take advantage of the situation while you can, and 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 really be on top on the last day. But the West Indies were delighted that they went off the field. It's almost as if England just. 
didn't, didn't believe that they could win the game, and didn't they? And they'd, they'd have looked down that batting line up, and they'd gone, cool, there's Viv Richards in there, there's, there's Gordon Greenwich in there, there's Clive Lloyd in there. Crikey, we've got to be careful, because you get yourself into that sort of frame of mind. Oh, yes, it was an absolutely mighty batting line. So we're talking about England's recent form over the previous winter have been very poor. So, yeah, they were a, a, a team low on confidence. Um, Alan Lamb's... Century was uh, the first of four he made in that summer of 1984, three uh, in successive games against West Indies, then a century in the one-off test against uh, Sri Lanka. He hadn't made a 50 in his previous seven tests, so a significant return to form for him, but he then went on a four-year century drought after that. Ian Botham's 81 was his highest score in uh, the 20 tests he played against, uh, against West Indies. So they did come off. And I remember there was a right old stink in the press the next day and England actually declared the next morning nine down and added only another 14 runs uh, with Alan Lamb himself out for 110. So West Indies set 342 to win in 78 overs on a fifth day pitch. Gordon Greenwich and anyone who played county cricket or indeed international cricket against Greenwich at the time knew if he walked out to bat limping, you were in trouble. You were in trouble. And sure enough, out he came because he would just stand there and play shots. And was that something that the West Indies also talked about, Fuzzy? Because, again, on the county circuit, I mean, you, you just pampered Gordon and you just looked after him, made sure a nice comfy chair. You just did not want to see him limping. Was, it, was that something the West Indies were aware of as well? Well, he was a real enigma, Gordon Greenwich, as everyone knows only too well, during his playing days and even after, probably more so as well. But uh, he, he, that type of personality never really said much, didn't speak a lot to, to fans or media or anything. But the fans always knew. That, that Gordon Greenwich, together with Desmond Haynes, of course, that, that durable, successful batting partnership. But, but yeah, from the moment you saw him limping, and it wasn't just limping when he would have walked out to bat at the start of the inning. If you saw him limping when the ninth wicket had fallen and, and, and the tenth wicket was <laughs> four, sorry, four, you knew he was getting himself in the zone. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it happens far too often for it to be purely coincidental. It's, it's almost as if he was willing himself to play a certain way, and part of that was limping along. Well, his hundred came from just 135 balls. Willis makes his way back. He's running in now, down the track, his feet in exactly the same places. He comes up now. Bowls to Greenwich on 99. Greenwich cuts this one, and this is going to be it. It goes to Fowler, but he's deeper this time. Greenwich gets his hundred, his hands up in the air, the bat in the air. He takes his cap off. No one, thank goodness, has run on to congratulate him, but we all applaud him from here, and so do the crowd. A very fine 100. West Indies, 149 for one. Yes, yeah, so no question of West Indies simply playing uh, playing for a draw. Gordon Greenwich, Andy, what can you tell us about, about him statistically? Uh, well, he was a superb opener over almost uh, two decades for West Indies, ending up with over 7,500 runs, average uh, 44. But this mid-80s period was probably his peak. He'd had a little bit of a lull in, in the middle of his career, but from uh, 1983... Uh, to uh, 1985 in 30 tests over three years, averaged 59 with uh, with seven centuries, including uh, two double centuries in this in this 1984 series. And uh, the mid 80s was very much his peak over a three year period from 1983 to 85. He averaged 59 in 30 tests with seven centuries, including two doubles in this series. He was one of the most destructive batsmen. Uh, of that time, that is for sure. And inevitably, how did he bring up his 200? Well, that's an extraordinary stroke. It was just as he played it, he had the feeling that he hadn't quite middled it. In fact, he did, and he's hit it for six and gone past the 200 mark to become only the ninth cricketer in the history of the game to make a double century at Lord's. Amazing. Actually, he'd only actually scored 144 uh, from eight innings in England uh, before that. But anything to note from that innings, Andy? Uh, well, well, 232 balls to reach his double hundred. And our ball's face weren't recorded for all innings. But at that point, it was the second fastest double hundred in terms of balls faced. Ian Botham reached 200 off 220 balls against India a couple of summers uh, before. And it uh, remains the only double century in Test cricket in a successful fourth innings chase and one of only five fourth innings 
double hundreds uh, ever made in tests. So it was uh, truly an extraordinary innings. What about at the other end then? Larry Gomes. Middlesex fans will remember Larry. Seemingly, I didn't know him very well, but a very quiet fellow, left-handed, just got about his game in a very, very quiet, uncomplicated way. Fazir, tell us about Larry Gomes. He made 92 not out at the other end. Well, every Trini, you know the rivalry in the, in the Caribbean territories. West Indies win, West Indies lose. Caribbean fans are quarrelling or cussing one another, as we would say, uh, over different issues. And many people were of the view in Trinidad and Tobago. Gordon Greenwich, you're going to get your double hundred. Why not allow Larry to get that hundred? The rarity <laughs> of a Trinidad and Tobago batsman getting a hundred in a test match at Lord because the first would have been Charlie Davis, someone many people may not recall, 1969. He averaged over 50 in just 15 test matches, but fell out of the game because there was no money in it at the time. Bernard Julian, the presumed successor to the great Sagarfield Sobers, got a hundred at Lords in 1973. And there's Larry, poised on the 90s, waiting for the chance to get a hundred, not getting any of the strike, and Greenwich blazes away. But Larry was the sort of individual, more of a fan of horse racing than, than cricket. In fact, you probably had to drag him out of the racing pool to get him to a game of cricket, even in his prime. So, But here, I'm sure you would have treasured the idea of scoring a Test match 100 at Lords, but Greenwich was on his own path. It, it, it's such a, a typical, classical West Indian <laughs> debate, that, isn't it? Only West Indians could have a go at Gordon Greenwich scoring 200. <laughs> Absolutely, because in the West Indies... When you win, you lose. When you lose, you definitely lose. <laughs> there, there, there's no turning back. Oh, it is, it is brilliant. Oh, Gomes is 92 not out. He's sort of 140 balls. And he was sort of known as the, the sort of the more defensive player in that lineup. This, in fact, was his fastest test innings in terms of runs per 100 ball of any time he scored over 35 in his test career. He had a fine series in 1984 and was a very good batsman away from home, made uh, four centuries uh, in Australia uh, for West Indies. Well, the game was up. Both of them had dropped Greenwich, actually, when he had about 110 from memory, and he's bowling off spin uh, near the end as the crowd are ready to come on the pitch. Ian Botham off two or three paces. He's bowled from the pavilion end, and he comes in now to Gomes, and Gomes goes back and hits the winning run through the offside for four. The West Indies have won this match by nine wickets, 344 for one, having been set 342 to win. Gordon Greenwich finishes 214 not out. Larry Gomes is 92 not out. The West Indies go 2-0 up in the series with one of the most remarkable victories in the history of Test cricket. The crowd is swarming onto the ground and the West Indies have won the match with, in fact, 11 overs to go. Amazing result. 11 overs to spare. Uh, what a run chase there, <laughs> nine wickets uh, in hand as well. There was, I remember, David, of course, David Gow was my Leicestershire captain at the time and he, of course, came back to play for us immediately after this game. I just remember the, the criticism that there was for him and particularly that bad light decision, which I suspect uh, will probably probably haunt him forever because I, I, I don't think anybody, I know that obviously Trevor is quite outspoken there and that little bit of commentary, but... It's a pretty hard one to justify, not not actually batting on that day with a man on 100. And Would he have changed anything? Who knows? Just, with 11 overs to spare and Gordon in that mood, maybe not. But it, it, that was certainly one of the main talking points of the game. Indeed it was. And, and many, many, when you look at that, there, there'll always be that, that talking point. I mean, just a few years ago, 2017, when Joe Root had that declaration at Headingley, leaving the West Indies with 330-odd. And actually, because of the batting of Shea Hope and Craig Brathwaite, they were able to pull it off. You, you're always going to have that. It, it really depends on the feeling at the time. And certainly, when you look back to 1984 at that time, on that fourth evening, it certainly felt that it was the wrong decision by, by David Gower then to, to, to have the team go off for bad light, especially for that rare situation where you've got the West Indies on the back foot and the chance really to put yourself in a very safe position. Yeah. And Andy, last thought from you on this, to put that all into context, I mean, it just... It just confirmed what we all knew. This was this was the, the best team in the world, winning from even difficult situations like that. Yeah, it was the fifth highest successful run chase in the history of Tests. It's still thirteenth uh, uh, in that list uh, now, after another thirteen hundred odd odd Test matches. And it was the the ease and speed with which which they did it, as you said. Um, 
almost 12 overs left out of the 78 overs that they were that they were given. I guess England did well to keep Clive Lloyd and Viv Richards quiet on a ground that they'd uh, had success before. And uh, they scored it over five and over. And um, it was only the second time in the history of Test that a team had made over 300 at more than five and over. And it remains one of only two occasions in which a team scored 300 plus at five and over or more in the fourth innings of a test Pakistan did so against Sri Lanka in Sharjah in 2014. So in in the context of the way cricket was played at the time, this was a, you know a, a statistically extraordinary innings as well as the, the 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 cricketing drama of it. There we go. I look back at 1984, one of the the great test matches, a memorable game and uh, you can catch that program on BBC Sounds if you just missed some of it and also the, the programme the, the, the actual highlights, the TV highlights available on the BBC iPlayer as well. Here at the Aegeus Bowl, well we've waited months to have cricket oh. and it has been one of the most bizarre days I think I can ever remember for all sorts of reasons not least the fact that it's barely rained all day and we have had only 17 overs cricket at the moment. The covers are still on, the floodlights are on, it's still overcast. It has brightened up, it does seem strange at the moment. Well, they're not playing, and I mean, there's one umpire out there with an umbrella up, but I mean, it's barely, I mean, there doesn't be anything in the, in the sky in terms of rainfall at the moment. And you, you do feel that as an effort to play could be made, but we're, we're moving towards a time where uh, it looks as if there won't be any more play today. Not that's not categorical because we we can play until 7:30, and what is it now? Uh, 10 to 6. But it has been tougher. He's alongside me. One of those sort of remarkably uh, remarkable days, really. I mean, it's so frustrating. Only we're used we're used to frustrating days at cricket, aren't we? But this this has been right up there. That's, this has been absolutely <laughs> right up there. I think that. Well, for a start off, if this had been a white ball game, a, tw a T20 oh. or a 50 over game, I think we would have played a, a lot more cricket. I mean, there, there was a little spell, wasn't it, when it's sort of like quite heavy mizzle. Um, and I think that it's a, we, we seem to be saying it every year that, you know, I think that this cricket, I know there's no one in the ground or anything, but cricket is an entertainment. You know, people want to watch it. And, and I think that people are going to have to get to grips, and this is the players I'm talking about, that you're going to have to play in light that's a little bit tricky and you're going to have to stay out there when there's a, the odd spot of rain. It's as simple as that. And so, you know, I think that things, you know, things have got to change a little bit because today has just been such a wind-up, if you know what mm, I mean. I do. We're, we're, we're all sat here and you know, all this money's been spent to put this game on, I say, albeit with no, no crowd and what have you, and then, you know, people are rumming and ahhing and sort of like, oh, is that a two spots of rain or one spot of rain, I've felt. Get out there and play. I think you can actually go as far as to say, if this had been a 50-over game, oh, they'd, have played all, all, they'd have played all day. All day, couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. And you say 20, 20, 100%. So that, that has changed and moved on and sort of like realised that you've got to get out there and you've got to, you've got to actually get involved with the game and get it moving. So so I think Test cricket might just have to have a little look at itself. I know that it's been a strange day off and on and what have you and the first day back and everything, but we could have got more cricket. It's as simple as that. We have had 17.4 overs and we started at 2 o'clock, off and on, off and on. Then we had a quite a concerted spell of, of cricket and then they came off just before half past four for what was an early tea. Bad light drove them off and then it, there's a little bit more rain and it's brightened up. As I say, it's hardly rained all day. That's the, what that's is, the really amazing What thing. is the difference? What is the difference between a 50-over game and a test match? I know it's got to be fair for both sides and everything. Mm. We all understand that. But as you say, in a 50-over game, we would have probably played all day here with the odd occasion that we, you know, we might nipped off for 20 minutes or half an hour. So what is the difference between test cricket? There's no sort of like risk to injury or sliding around because they're still doing that, if not more, in the one-day game. So I, I just don't get it, and, it, and, it's, and it's been frustrating. And it's great to be back and lovely and what have you, but we just could have had, could have had some more cricket. I mean, what was the... the um we were waiting 45 minutes at one stage when it had stopped raining it was warm the light was good mm. you know and then everyone was just sort of out there kicking a football about and everything get get the covers off and get going yeah. well, I thought for example when the toss was held at half past one the start was at two o'clock well it, it'd been dry for ages well, have the toss and then start 
15, 20 minutes later. You can do that now under the regulations. You don't have to have half an hour. Are we getting grumpy a bit early? <laughs> are, we, are we getting a little bit grumpy yeah. on day one? I mean, it's not, it's not been a straightforward day by any no, means for the umpires no. because it, there has been mizzle around, there's been overcast conditions, but people look at the floodlights and say, what's the point of them then? If, you know, you've got floodlights. I think, I think they're going to need to address it, you know, because it's, it's, you know, we want Test cricket to, well, to survive for a start yeah. off. You know, we want it to thrive like, like the white ball and the T20 and everything. And I think they're just going to have to be, and I think it's going to have to come from the players as well. Yeah. You know, I can remember when I was playing, you know, and there's a bit of rain about. We're all looking at the umpire and going, come on, you know, let's all go off and everything. But times have changed, haven't they? And I think that, you know, They've got, to, they've got to get out there a bit more, similar as. Right, our Radio 4 Longwave listeners are off the shipping forecast back soon. One other point, of course, as well, is we do play uh, pink ball day night test cricket. We, well, play I... with, we play with the lights on in test cricket. You know, if we play Shot when yourself it's... in the foot a bit there. We play when it's dark. I mean, I, I know this is a left field suggestion. It's one I've mentioned before. That if, do if we... You... So could you could you not just ch- change? The, I know this. I know to, to get the game going. Could you not change the ball in situations like this to say we're going to play with a pink ball while the light is not great? Yeah, I mean, I, think I know. I know that's, that sounds quite radical. It sort of changes the balance of the game, but surely it's about playing cricket, not rather than not playing cricket. I couldn't agree more. And so we always, you say, it's got to be fair for both sides, and you know, da di da, and all this kind of stuff gets trotted out, doesn't it? At the, you know, when, when we have days like this. But at the end of the day, you know. I mean, get playing. Simply yeah. as you say, it doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter necessarily if you know. Perhaps it swung a bit more for the West Indies, or didn't swing enough for England, or something like that. I want to see some people, you know, running about and having a game. It's yeah. so frustrating. And there are variables in cricket as well. You know, yeah. if, you happen, if you happen to turn up on a sunny day, there you go. And as an opening batsman, that's that's your good fortune. You turn up at Headingley, and it's overcast yeah. and humid, and the ball swings around. Well, that's just part of the variable of the game as well. So. I think the players might have to play a critical part in this. You know, someone might just have to, you know, because the players all sort of like, you know, want to make sure that they've got a little bit of an edge or, you know, we don't want to be giving away, you know, a situation or a part of the game that sort of like they feel is a bit unfair. But um, I think, you know, I I think they've almost got to say, come on now, we've got to, we've got to give, give the public something. The umpires have been out there for ages. What are they doing? I don't, out I don't there? know. They're just, They're just standing there. One of them has got an umbrella up, and and, and two haven't. I mean, crikey, how many? Uh, you know, you can't even go to a restaurant tonight, so they're not deciding where they're going to go for <laughs> dinner. You know what I mean? They have been stood out there virtually all day in a little huddle. What are they talking about? What about the cricket we have seen today? Good, toughers. Quite enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I think the West Indies got off to a good start. You could tell that they were sort of like, you know, up for it and bowled some good lines and lengths, got rid of Sibley early on. Um, and a little bit of a tricky spell there for, uh, for England. You know, that the, 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 there was cloud cover, it was seeming around a little bit. And then I just felt that the West Indies let England off the hook a little bit, really. Bowled a little bit too wide and a little bit too short. I mean, the short balls weren't as bad, but I think the width... You know, there was a lot of leaves, you know, and just watching the ball go sort of sailing through to the wicketkeeper. So England just started to claw their way back uh, into quite a reasonable position. And I think on a frustrating start-stoppy kind of day, which is always difficult for both batsmen and bowlers, I think that England will just be sitting in that dressing room thinking to themselves, well, you know, I think we've, you know, we could have easily lost two or three there and we've done all right just to lose one. The scheduled... um Sort of cut off time is not, is seven o'clock. Um, Thirty minutes extra time can be played after seven o'clock, but we need to be playing by seven. Listen, there's not. So they can't come back after seven. Um, the umpires are concerned about the light, as it's not improved uh, since they went out there. But, Listen, um, they're continuing to monitor it. That's the reason they're out there. Coming to Continue to monitor uh, the light, but I mean, they're not going to play now. They might as well call it off now. There you it's, go. It's not, it's not going to get any be- better than this, you wouldn't think. There's you? No, and I'll tell you what it is also, Simon. It, it's the kind of the feeling of enthusiasm to play, if you know what I mean. We can all sit here now and we're getting the enthusiasm that actually, you know, they've all kind of had enough for today. It's been on off and frustrating. Let's all go back and have a little sort of bath and, mm. and a cup of tea, you know what I mean? And, and so I think it's the enthusiasm that everyone wants to get out there, you know, at, at all costs. You know, well, not at all costs, but, you know, 
you've got to have that sort of, you know, you've got to have that enthusiasm for going and want to go out there. And, and it just as you say, the umpire's down in there with a bloody up over the chat. It doesn't give that vibe, does it? No. Do, do you think they, we would have had, well, there'd be more pressure on the umpires to play if there'd been a, a crowd in today? Well, yeah. I mean, I was upstairs on my balcony, you know, on my me, on me half an hour going, get the covers off, <laughs> you know, and slow hand capping, and it didn't particularly uh, mean a thing. But I think perhaps, yeah, and it just has that feel, doesn't it, that sort of... Yes, I think I think you're right. You know, if there had been a full house here and people, you know, sort of getting stuck in a little bit, there would have just been that there would have been that enthusiasm and that vibe to get back out there. Look, if it's pouring with rain, you can't play cricket. It's mm. as simple as that. I mean, presumably they would have taken a reading on their light meters just before half past four when they took the players off, and normally that's what they go by for the rest of the game. So perhaps it you know, hasn't improved. Get a on couple the of spinners meters. on there. Well, if, if the light's bad, why can't you start with a couple of spinners? Well, I can understand why they wouldn't want to do that because they they want to make the most of the conditions. West Indies. He's what, they, what conditions? You're not making the most of anything if you sat in the sat well, in no, the, I know. Sat in the pavilion, are you? I know, but they'll. They, they, if, they, if they had to bowl spinners, though, they would rather be off themselves, wouldn't they? And well, until tomorrow to come back well, and bowl with their pace bowlers. Well, well, there you go. The, the, this is where I think slightly the attitude has got to change in Test cricket. You know. I think you, you've got to now, you know, try your hardest to get out there and have a game because otherwise, how many we, we, we've, how many times do we say this every summer? Mm. You know, we're all sitting there scratching our heads. Well, come on, you know, why is it taking so long? Yeah. You know, it needs to be a bit more, a bit more snappy, yeah. you know. I mean, there are some days when it feels more obvious than others they should be playing. And this, I think today does feel like one where they, we, should have, had a, we should have had a lot more play yeah. than we've had. Yeah. Disappointing, but hey-ho, you know what I mean? Tomorrow it'll be good. No rain tomorrow, eh? No rain after about ten o'clock in the morning. Oh, <laughs> and you never know. You never know with these things. That could linger a bit longer. Yeah. But I, I think light might be more an issue again tomorrow. Just looking at the forecast, there's going to be cloud cover around tomorrow, and then after that, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it looks clear for three days. So yeah. there's, still, there's still plenty of time uh, left in the game uh, for a result. I mean, I know what you mean. That you know, if it is gloomy and the ball, and you're not picking the ball up and what have you, you know, what I mean, then bounces and things do come into it. So you have got to think of player safety. But oh, you know, what a what a what a funny old day. Well, it's that thing, isn't it, about looking forward to cricket for so long. I, I, I think least, I think that comes into the equation. <laughs> it, as well. It does, yeah. yeah. And the fact that they tried so hard to get the games on. Yeah. And then we have a situation like this. You think, well, yeah. come on, Don't but. I quite like your idea about changing the ball. <laughs> Not a bad well, it, show. Uh, to, to me, it sounds. I mean, I think. But would it, it be a new one? Or well, you? they'd have to have a box of balls that yeah. were, you know, some would be new, some would be ten overs, some would be twenty overs. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the the pink balls. Yeah. I mean, just. I think I just have this feeling in about 20 years' time, they'll look back and they say, Do you know what they used to do in the old days? Yeah. They always used to go off. They used to go off, <laughs> and they could have just used this ball. And, you know, they played day night test cricket. I just had that feeling. I may be wrong. Yeah. You know, it may be too iconoclastic. It may yeah. change the balance of the game yeah. too much. I mean, people, I, mean, I'm, you know, I remember West Indies last time they were here at Edgbaston in the pink ball test match. They lost 19 wickets in a day. I mean, it can, it can do a bit, can't it? It can do a bit more. I mean, England probably thinking, Oh, no, we don't want to. We don't want a pink ball out there in these conditions. No. Might, you know, think of Joe Denley and, and Rory Burns. They're probably happy to be sitting in the pavilion at the moment, thinking, well, tomorrow might be a better day, clearer, yeah. and all that sort of thing. But in terms of... we, I think of the aspect of... It, it, cricket is such a game of fair play, isn't it, in the spirit of cricket and everything. I'd rather see just some cricket, yeah. whether it be with a pink ball or not and everything, you know, and what have you. And if, OK, well, one side do better and get the rub of the green on that day, well, OK, mm. you know. I suppose, anyway. it, I suppose it might make a difference, the fact there are no spectators here, in the sense that you're, you know, you're playing for a paying public, aren't you? I know there are people watching on television in the UK and, and listening to us on radio and, and watching all around the world as well. Mm. Here's Andy. But, what, but, what, well, just on, on that, today is a day where there's not a lot of sport going on around the world. This is a huge opportunity, yeah. isn't it, for cricket to yeah. market itself to yeah. a... Yeah. New audience, yeah. and nothing's going on, and it's not raining. <laughs> uh, just a, a quick statistical thing to look out for. Rory Burns is on 999 Ooh. test runs. Overnight. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a nasty place to be. But if he uh, went, assuming that uh, tomorrow or at some point in the future he scores one more run for England, yeah. um, he'll be the first uh, England player to pass the 1,000 runs as an opener mark since Alistair Cook did so in 2007. 
So let's hear from the England camp now. Henry Moran is with uh, Graham Thorpe, the England assistant coach. Yes, over on the far side of the ground uh, here, Simon. It's not raining at the moment. Uh, Graham, you've got your bag over your shoulder. It feels <laughs> like the end of a frustrating day. Yes, it does. Uh, it's it been, un- been unfortunate. Obviously, you know, long um, uh, wait for the return uh, to cricket this, this summer. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, with the weather around today, it hasn't quite been the day we wanted. Um, but obviously, we've got some out there. We've got, we, we got the Test Series underway. How nice was it to see the toss happening, see the players head to the middle and get Test Cricket back up and running after this break? Yeah, it's great. It's really, really important. I mean, as we know, through the, the country and around the world, it's been a really difficult period. And uh, slowly, things are, are progressing back to, to how they were uh, before. Um, and, and just for us to get cricket underway in this country again with the support of the West Indies uh, is fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're grateful for the West Indies to be over here. Do you think more could have been played today? Do you think we could have seen a few more deliveries bowled? It, it has been that very fine uh, mizzle um, <laughs> with, with heavy cloud cover for a lot of the day. So you've got a bit of bad light and a little bit of mizzle around. But possibly... Possibly, but you've got to leave it to the umpires to let them do their jobs and, uh, and, and the players generally do as they're told. The light in Karachi in 2000 was <laughs> slightly worse than this. I mean, it it cricket, could, it cricket could, could play. I mean, the, the light we're in at the moment, it feels like you could be seeing play out there, doesn't it? Well, it's probably, in terms of when they take their, their readings, and, and that is generally how umpires go nowadays, they look at their reading, and if it gets to that point, then, then we're off. Yeah, gone are the days of Karachi. <laughs> <laughs> now, before play started, we saw that, that hugely symbolic moment when mm. players and support staff uh, took a knee. Can you talk us yeah. through how that came about today? Well, I mean, conversations over the last few days, just amongst uh, uh, whether it's Joe and, uh, and, and, and Jason Holder and the West Indies uh, management as well, um, with ourselves having a, our own uh, chat and discussion as, as, a, as a team uh, yesterday. And um, we felt it was important to show solidarity with the West Indies um, cricket team uh, and also just in general. Um, we don't want racism in, in our game. You know, I mean, it, it's quite clear and, and we want a, a, a fair and equal society as well for our children. So those types of things were discussed. Um, and I think that, that, that brought it home uh, to us that it... Uh, it was absolutely right to do it. We've seen many powerful moments on cricket fields, but with no play happening at that moment, that was right up there, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was, and and you, and you, you felt you were in, in, in a part of something which was uh, a very important as well. Um, as I say, you know, discussions have been, you know, quite open um, from our perspective as well. But obviously, what we've seen. Um, over the last few months, uh, we want our world to be fair and, uh, and, and equal. And so those discussions, I, I think, were very maturely led by, our, by some of our players as well. Just finally, how much are you looking forward to seeing a full day's test cricket as and when we do get to see one? Yeah, very much so. I think you know, it's a little bit of you know, the cobwebs coming off. Um, but I was, I was quite pleased with the, with the quality of cricket, which was, which was going down. As you'd expect, the guys have been training hard. We've had our warm-up games. Um, and it felt like, uh, you know, the, the, the game was on again. And I'm sure over the course of these three test matches, uh, we know that it's going to be tough cricket against the West Indies. And you know, we're looking forward to it. Looking forward to some nice full days as well. Fingers crossed those uh, rain clouds stay away. Thanks for your time, Graham. Thank you. That's Graham Thorpe speaking to Henry Moran on the far side of the ground, a, a socially distanced interview, as they all have to be uh, during this test match, indeed during this uh, test series and test summer. The lights are still on, the umpires are still out there, the, um, the umbrella has, has come down. Graham thought uh, has to be diplomatic about the, the umpires, he, they have to be so careful about what they say about umpires and their decision making, totally understand that, so being uh, diplomatic, I just feel there could have been uh, more play today. Uh, we are going to have a, a review of the day in just a moment, I can see Michael here and uh, Carlos Brathwaite is here as well. How, how frustrating, Carlos, has it been for West Indies today, you know, in these conditions, not actually being able to make the most of them in terms of, you know, not having that much play to do so? You would say driving to the ground, um, but walking across the ground in the morning, um, seeing the overhead conditions, wanting to bowl first and then having the opportunity to do so. Um, it's a shame that they couldn't um, use the use the conditions a lot more today. Um, I didn't think they used them as well as they probably could have in the last few overs, um, but 
you know, over the course of a day's play, you have ebbs and flows, and they'd be a little bit frustrated that they haven't been able to use the first day's play and extract the amount of um, the extract the amount of substance from the wicket and from the atmosphere as was possible. Hmm. How much did it do for them? Do you think Jonathan's going to come in actually and join uh, you and, and Michael? How much did it do for them out there? Did it, did it, did it do as much or, as you thought it would, or actually are you hoping for a bit more movement? Hoping for a bit more movement, but it did just enough. Um, you, you could see Shannon Gabriel's first couple overs, balls touching down similar spots and moving just enough to um, take the off bail. Um, rap persons on the pads. I just think that after they came back out, they didn't challenge the stumps enough. Um, so when the ball did what it had to do, whether it be laterally or in some cases, um, the inconsistency in bunks, it was too wide outside the off stump to actually um, create a chance. So that would be the only shame for me. Good for the boys to get some overs under the belt. Um, and tomorrow, with the knowledge that they have now, hopefully they can start back the way they started and continue for a little longer. Indeed. Thank you, Carl. I'm just looking at the umpires. They're sort of mincing off quite quickly, uh, as if they've got sort of an urgent appointment or something. But I think that suggests uh, that play might have been called off uh, for the day at the moment. It's still this bad light stop players showing on the screens, but just the way that they are marching off and they, they're going their separate ways. So one will go to the England dressing room and another to the West Indies dressing room. And that looks to me, Michael, as if it's the sort of, the sort of walk of an umpire who's, um, who's, who's about to pull the plug. Yeah, it looks that way. You see Richard Calbra just going to the right of us. He's going to the England uh, side of the, the dressing area. He'll be letting uh, Ben Stokes know. And it uh, looks like Richard Ung was going up the, the left side towards uh, the West Indian side. Jason Holder being told, yep. A bit bizarre, I have to say, the last hour that we've been pretty much sat here watching the covers be on, the, the umpires to our left having a nice conversation. Uh, it's not rained uh, and we've seen no cricket. It has been a strange day all around. I mean, disappointing with all the preparation and the build-up and the anticipation and all the incredible lengths that so many people have gone to to get this game on, on the road, but to have such little cricket... Uh, early lunch, early tea and a late tea and all of those things just to get 17 overs in has been uh, a, a real shame but it, you, know, you look at the weather just north of where we are and uh, there's been a lot of rain falling we've just been on the very back edge of that and uh, unfortunately that has uh, restricted uh, the action here today so we'll have our review of the day I think we're assuming that, uh, that uh, those, the umpires there have, have, have called it off that's been confirmed. It is now uh, abandoned. So we'll have our, uh, our review of the day. We're going to hear from Shannon Gabriel uh, in a bit. That's always exciting. Uh, down at the, uh, the position way in the distance there where we're allowed to do our interviews and so on. So this is our review of the, the first day of the first test between England and the West Indies at the Aegeus Bowl in the bio bubble, which has got international cricket returned again, uh, which is fantastic. We're all looking forward to it so much. It's been a pretty disappointing day, frankly. Only 17.4 overs were able to be bowled and in that time England made 35 for the loss of one wicket they were naught for one when Dominic Sibley was bowled by Gabriel playing no shot uh, for naught was it the sort of misjudgment that we might expect with batsmen having not had any practice so on possibly but anyway he'll be he'll be pretty cross I think as having got out that way the ball just came back a little bit uh, from the big fast bowler but that was the fourth ball that Sibley faced naught for one off he went for a duck well, Rory Burns, I thought, looked pretty comfortable. He made 20 not out. And Joe Denley, well, as he does, he, he made a, a solid start. It looked to be in, in pretty good fettle, actually. 14 not out uh, from the 48 uh, balls that he faced. Bowling-wise, it was tidy bowling from West Indies. I think we'll hear from Carlos Brathwaite in a minute. Thinking perhaps they might have bowled a little bit fuller, but Gabriel took the wicket. He's bowled uh, five overs, one for 19. Otherwise, it's been a pretty quiet day out in the middle. It's just been a case, I think, of everybody trying to get used to the very strange alien environment in which this match is being played in, uh, not, not least, of course, the players too, although they've been here for, for a, a couple of weeks or more. It still, it still just takes them getting used to see cricket played in this, uh, this, this very, very clinical uh, way with no spectators at all in the ground and uh, temperature checks wherever you go and so on. Let's start with you, Carlos, shall we? And see, how, what do you reckon? The, the, the weather, the, the background, the, the bio-bubble and so on. I mean, in, in a way, 
there's still four days to go. It's a good weather to come. Maybe the West Indies might go for look, That's a day out of the way. We've, we're actually off and running now. We've been here. We've been in this rather strange environment for a while. At least we've got out there and stretched our legs a bit. Yeah, it's different. You're waiting for your test series to start um, can be quite... Um, it can raise anxiety, put it that way. But once the games um, get going and the days happen and you get into the routine of, you know, warming up, playing... Um, cooling down, recovering, going again. It makes it a little easier. So I think the biosecure bubble will be a lot easier now um, to get in and get out of because you're back into a routine of actually playing and yes. doing stuff that you would do normally. Um, still very, very strange, to, um, I guess, for you guys to not be able to go and get some dinner, um, <laughs> go and do something outside of the ground. Um, but, yeah, at least a sense of normalcy is resumed with the first ball of the summer being bowled. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point you make. And when actually, when you are playing a test match and you do finish quite late, actually, you, you, you don't go out. I mean, you, you just do sit and have a quiet evening and have something to eat and, and talk through the game a bit. And you, you go to bed, don't you? I mean, and that, that's kind of what it's going to be like now anyway, in normal circumstances. Yeah, you're waking back up to do it all again tomorrow. And, and as is with test cricket, once you lose, play... Um, as much as we've lost today as well, you then add some on to the morning, you add some on to the evening. So all the other days now will be a lot longer than yes. than normal. So there won't be much downtime, um, especially with the rigours needed for test cricket. And it'd be interesting to see how the bodies hold up. I mean, there's only been how many overs? 17, 17 overs. Yes. Um, so it shouldn't be too much. Hopefully it was a good warm-up or such rather than a test uh, um strength but again I think it's a good opportunity for the boys to reflect they would have had a glimpse now of what the wicket does bowling in the surroundings actually being in a test match as opposed to a warm up game a practice game um, and for them to now use this small sample size um, to go and plot and plan to come out and do what they need to do and what they've done well in a very small segment um, over a longer period of time it's interesting, Michael, I, I, there's a bit of a debate going around, and I, I totally get it. So asking why, why they don't start at 10.30, because we, we talk about the 11 o'clock start really being for spectators to make the journey for the, the, the slight reduction uh, in rail fares and so on, for people coming to the, to the venues, if you're going to Lords or whatever it may be, that's often the reason it's given for an 11 o'clock start, but there is no crowd. Everyone's here. <laughs> why, why don't they just start at 10.30 and, and, and get, the, get the play done? Why don't we start at 9? Well, we could do. <laughs> just, just have breakfast and potter straight to work. I mean, all the players... But everybody is here. Yeah, why, why guess, wait until 11 o'clock? I just think Test Match Cricket, oh, it, it, like it, 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 you can just hear Graham Thorpe in the background saying, see you later, Cat, that's to Phil Tufnell. I don't think he can see him later. He's in a can't. different bubble. You're not allowed to, Graham, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, but uh, thanks for sending uh, you know, a wave mm. or two to, to Philip. Um, test Cricket, if you actually look at it, I guess, in the last hour and a half, you know, the light has been a bit gloomy. Hmm. But it's not the, the fault of the umpires, it's not the fault of the present day players, it's the, it's the fault of Test Match Cricket in general that nothing gets... You know, Test Match Cricket in the last hour should have been playing. Yes, it was gloomy, yes, it could be a little bit awkward, but that's just the, the rub of the green and the conditions that you may have to bat or not. You know, you have to be able to overcome that. Would T20 cricket have been played in the last hour and a half? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Would 50 yeah. over cricket have yeah. been played? Absolutely. You know, we've been in this locked down for such a long period of time, day one. I know the rain caused a problem in the morning, but cricket has to be better than just going off for a bit of bad light. It has to be. You know, it's a perfect opportunity to profile the game. And as I say, you can't blame the umpires because they're under strict guidance and that's what they have to do. But, you know, we spoke about it for so long. It's like the over we, we get bored of talking about that, but nothing ever gets no. done. And it's so important that, you know, the administrators and the people that can make a difference realise that it's affecting Test Match cricket. It really is. And you mentioned, you know, changing from 11 o'clock to half past. It won't be done because it's common sense. <laughs> it, it won't be done. No, no. You know, we'll be here at nine o'clock in the morning. Everyone will be wandering around. The players will can we just start? And obviously, there's TV schedules, and, and I'm sure Sky wouldn't mind at all to starting at half past 10. They'd be fine with it. But uh, it's test match cricket, and not a great deal seems to be done. Down to the far end of the ground we go, and Henry Moran is with Shannon Gabriel. Well, Shannon, that didn't feel exactly like the start of a test summer. It's been a frustrating day all round. How's it been for you with, uh, with the weather and the delays? Oh, it's been a bit tough, um, off and on. Um, just, you just have to try and keep switched on um, when you come off the field and when you get back on. It was a bit tough day, but thank God um, we've been doing well so far. 
How have the last few weeks in England been for you preparing for this series? It's like cricket, but not as we know it, I suppose. Um, it's been all right. Um, a bit tough um, in terms of like, the lockdown and stuff like that, but the guys um, know what were, was up before coming here, so I think mentally we were prepared before we left them. Talk us through that delivery that got the wicket. It may not have been a day that's seen much cricket, but that was a special moment. Oh, uh, yes. Um, it was, I think it was a good delivery. Um, after coming back from almost a year off from um, Test cricket, uh, it feels good to be back. Tomorrow, I suppose, the hope is that the cloud cover stays around and the fast bowlers can make the most of conditions that were so close today had you been able to get out there for, for really advantageous positions for you as fast bowlers to, to make the most of. Uh, yeah, um, I think the wicket is a bit on the slower side still. Some balls bouncing something so it's just important for us to come tomorrow and put the ball in the right areas and um, do the job and you of course not necessarily someone that would have expected to be playing this first game having been added late to the squad how nice is it to be involved in the action immediately uh, it's a good feeling to be back honestly um, as I said after that long layoff from cricket so it's just a good feeling to be back and hopefully everything goes well for me in the shoes and just finally talk us through that moment before play started uh, when the West Indies and England players took a knee um, I think it was a great moment. It was showing um, something that we stand for, um, uh, racism. I think it has no part in cricket. So I think it was good on um, both, our, both team to stand for it. Yeah. Shannon, thanks for your time. Yeah. Shannon Gabriel with a wicket to his name. Dom Sibley playing no stroke. And uh, he'll be reliving that, I suspect. It, it, it came back a little bit. But it, it was it a was, bit of an angle there as well. It, yeah. I guess we've got to be fair to him that, you know, the ball before, it was a, a very similar delivery, wide of the crease. You know what Shannon Gabriel's going to deliver. He's going to go wide of the crease, angle the ball into the stumps, and he bowled a delivery that Dom Sibley played at, and it seemed away. Now, the ball that he got out to is actually a little bit more to the, the, the offside, so it's probably an inch or so wider than the ball that he played and missed to, and it nipped back, and it's that dreaded sound as a batsman. Yeah. I, I think... There's, there, there are excuses. Clearly, he hasn't had a lot of cricket there. There's one excuse. But the actual skill levels of the ball, whether the bowler you know, really meant to get that ball to come back, only he can tell us that. But, you know, it, it did seem... Um, and it's just that it's an awful sound as a batsman. It really is. It's the worst sound when you've left a ball, you've not played a shot, and all of a sudden you hear that clatter of the ball onto the off stump. He's now got a long way to, uh, I would think, to, to have another knock in the second innings. Yeah. As far as the toss is concerned... Yeah, Carlos, what, what do you think? I mean, do you, th what, do you think the West Indies were happy to be bowling first? You were saying yesterday about get out there and bowl, and I must have, you know, as an old bowler myself, I thought, oh, it's a nice day to bowl today. And yet the batsmen up here all saying, oh, no, bat first, bat first. I'd be surprised by that. It's an age-old um, conundrum, who wants to bat first, who wants to bowl first? I know if Craig Braffitt was captain, he'd be chomping at your bit to bat first. He'd bat first on water. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> Is that right? Is that right? <laughs> um, but I personally thought that um, with the conditions and with the atmosphere, with everything that's been going on, the lack of cricket, lack of rhythm, that it was probably best to bowl first, get the cobwebs out, get back into the swing of things, and then the overhead conditions just made it more of um, a no-brainer for me. Obviously, England had different ideas. They probably have a different way of playing, and as you can see with the team selection, probably want to go a different route and stand by certain ideals, so kudos to them. Um, but, yeah, I think it, it benefited both parties. If you asked, um, no toss. What do yeah. you want to do, Ben? What do you want to do, Jason? I think Ben would have batted Jason with a ball. Yeah, so. they would not, not bothering to toss the coin up. <laughs> Ideal yeah. scenario. What are you, Michael? Were you, were you batting today? Yeah, I was, just because I, I saw quite a lot of the, the warm-up game here uh, last, last week, and, and it was very dry, and it took quite a lot of spin, and there was a little bit of unevenness. And as we've seen already today, I mean, we've only had 17 overs, and there has been the odd ball kind of trickle through to the keep and the odd ball that's bound, so... It was, it, it was a 60-40. Uh, it was one of those tosses that you probably wanted to lose uh, yeah. as a captain. Uh, but I do think Ben made, made the, the right call. I think when Sibley was out in the second over, and I think then was Joe Denley went to play a pork shine. It just looped to mid-on, just short. Um, you know, England would have been slightly nervous. But, you know, the conditions may be cloudy tomorrow, but you just felt that those 17 overs, it, I think the West Indies needed to cause a bit more damage than the one wicket in the column because for the first eight to ten overs I thought they were magnificent you know I thought they bowled the right lengths uh, they brought the batsman forward and it looked like any minute they were going to get another wicket and then Shannon Gabriel bowled an over and he bowled two bounces and he bowled a, he bowled a short wide one to Denley he got it way down to and it was almost like the, the rhythm of the game changed after that over and then Jason Holder came on he bowled okay I thought he put a ball straighter and a bit fuller but he bowled what I call pretty 
you know, just into the pitch. It went through to the keeper nicely. It looked nice, but it was ooh, not going to have any. Ours. Yeah, yeah, yes. ooh, uh, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> Carlos. But it wasn't to any effect in, in terms of getting wickets. Uh, and Alzari Jovis came, he just looked rusty. Yes. You know, he, he, he got you know a couple on his hip. Rory Burns, and he's not going to miss that opportunity. From an England batting perspective, I, I thought they coped with it very nicely. It, they look busy. You know, in, in conditions that aren't ideal, uh, in conditions that you know you're potentially going to be going off at any stage, it's so important that you stay active and you stay busy in your movements. And I thought Denley, and in particular Rory Burns, I thought, thought he was uh, very impressive. When you think he's back into the side, yes. having missed those last three games in South Africa, he'll be slightly nervous. You know, they all will, but particularly when you come back into the side. And I thought he's settled in uh, very nicely indeed. Yeah. Do you think it is a straight, uh, sort of Denley, uh, Crawley, Choice so is it? Is it really just come down to that for when when Root comes back? Well, you know, you could always move um, Zach Crawley up to open the batting as well. So I would say that Sibley's going to be nervous. You know, yeah. if Denley gets runs and Zach Cr- Crawley gets runs, and Sibley's one of the four that misses out of that top four, you you would say that he's going to be probably looking over his shoulder for next week because Joe Root will replace one of that top four. Yes. And if Burns gets runs, if Denley gets runs, and Zach Crawley gets runs, it's very difficult to to knock on the door of any of those three and say, oh, by the way, Joe's in for you. Whereas Dom Sibley's not got, got any runs. I know you've got a tremendous century in Cape Town, but it's all about the here and now, and, and Sibley will have a, 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 a worrying couple of nights because he'll have to go out and score runs in the second innings. Uh, he won't want you know, his, his teammates to fail at all, but uh, if Crawley and Denley score runs... And I, I, I'm pretty sure um, Rory Burns is a shoo-in. You know, I think he's absolutely going to play. He's, yes. he's kind of the opening batsman for England for a while. He's he's doing really well in, in that position. People don't talk about his, his little quirkiness anymore, do they? No, as if he's shrug it off and that's... You know, I guess he's a player. He, yeah. and, and what I really like about Rory Burns is he works it out for himself. You yeah. know, we saw him against Ireland last year in the Test match where his hands were away from his body and he snuck off a couple of times and we are all going, oh, what's he going to do against Cummins, Hazelwood and Stark? Um, the week later at Edgebaston, he, he played beautifully. He got like tremendous hundred yes. and then he got found out with the bouncers. And all of a sudden he went away and he worked that out himself. He didn't need telling. So he looks at cricket. He's been around the block for a while. He's played for Surrey for a number of years, been a, a very consistent scorer. Um, and he just looks to me like he knows himself. That's so important at this level. Yeah. I'll come back to you in a second, Carlos. I just, because we talk about the selection and they've shown they're ruthless because mm. Stuart Broad's gone. Uh, and that, you know, it's not a question of uh, a rotation or when they're only going to play, you know, Jimmy and, and him in, in different games or whatever. Oh, no, no. I mean, this is, this is, you know, he's lost his place. Yeah, he has. Um, he, he'll be angry. You know, in the last yeah. year, he's, he's got, you know, a, a very handy average of 48 wickets at 23. Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty good. But, you know, I, I'm happy. He reminded the... me himself. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm sure, sure he's, yeah. he's sending a few WhatsApps to, to a few people. But I like the way England have done it. You know, I think. You know, if you look at the way that they won the World Cup, it was a four-year cycle of, of, of planning the team and the way that they wanted to play to win that World Cup. I know Test cricket is different, but you know, when Chris Silver got the job, first and foremost, he says, right, we, we've got to be competitive in Australia in, in, in three years' time when he took over that role. And by doing so, he's obviously looked at what they're going to require. It's going to be pace, a little bit of pace in Australia, too, if you can get that. And then Archer and Woodball with a decent amount of gas. Um, realistically, are Anderson and Broad going to be a partnership in Australia next time? Uh, I, I don't think so. You know, you look at the last two times England have been there, they've lost 4 0, 5 0 with those two players. So I think they've been ruthless, but I think it's the right decision going forward. You yeah. know, it, it, Stewart will play, he might play next week, he'll certainly play the third if he doesn't, and he'll, he'll probably play a few games against Pakistan. Uh, but I, I like the fact that England have, have stuck to their principles of what they're trying to achieve in the long term, but also looking at now. It's not that they've picked a team thing and we don't mind losing now to winning Australia. They believe that this four, at the minute, is their best four. Stokes, Wood, Archer and Anderson to beat the West Indies this week with Don Best, the off-spinner. Uh, and I, I don't mind a, an angry Stuart Broad. <laughs> I don't mind an angry Stuart Broad. So whenever he gets that opportunity... Let's, let's be honest, Agus, in a year and a half's time in Brisbane in that first test, if Anderson and Broad are in the squad, only one will play. And that first test in Brisbane, you would say probably Stuart Broad would be the player yes, because it bounces in Brisbane. The week after in Adelaide with the pink ball, hmm. you'd probably go Jimmy Anderson with the pink ball. But what we've seen this week, it looks to me like if everyone's fit and firing, uh, England are only going to play one of the, yeah. the outstanding two legends, Anderson and Broad. Do you think we are too ashes-obsessed, Carlos? 
Now, here we are, we're playing against the West Indies, and we're talking about the Ashes at 18 months' mm. time, what the attack... Do, do you think we are a bit obsessed with it? And Jason Holder's calling me, should I ask him? <laughs> <laughs> he's calling you now. <laughs> oh, please answer, answer it. it. Yeah. <laughs> I play uh, golf with I, Jason. He's a, he's a very enthusiastic golfer. Very he's good a, golfer, uh, yeah. Well, he's yeah. a long way, I think, isn't yes. he? So, do you think we are Ashes obsessed? You, here we are, we're <laughs> starting a series. Tell him to go away, I'll talk to you later. Um, Jace, um, um, the te- answer? Jace, you're on air. You're on air on, on BBC Radio. <laughs> I can see him too, he's looking a bit confused. I'm on air. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're on air. <laughs> what, what, what do you want to say? <laughs> he says he's coming up. He's coming up. <laughs> You're he's not allowed to be in a biosecure bubble, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not bad to have the captain. That's why I'm coming up. Not bad to have the captain live on. Um, off he goes. Oh, well, well done, Carlos. You brought a bit of something to us there. And it, and it means we've only got 50 seconds left for you to answer my question. Do you think um, we are Ashes obsessed? No, I think it's good planning. And okay. that's why I think um, to, to um, kind of fill in with the whole Zach Crawley versus Dom Sibley type stuff. Joe Rook coming in has his play, place, but Denley at three shows that he's the incumbent. Um, and you can see with the way they plan for the World Cup as well that it is definitely um, persons who are showings versus persons who have to work their way in. And apparently Jack, Zach Crawley has to work his way in, but Dom Sibley has his place. There we go. There are all, all sorts of sign language going on there with the West Indies coming. Thank you, Carlos, for struggling through that last one. There. Thank you, Michael, very much indeed. And a guffawing uh, Jason Holder is heading off uh, to his bedroom, I suspect. Uh, five live sports action next as commentary uh, on somebody against Burnley in the Premier League. I don't think it's the West Indies, it says on my screen. Uh, it's not quite the return to cricket we're hoping for today, but you can watch highlights at 7 o'clock this evening. We're back on air at 10.45 tomorrow. Goodbye.